Uh, this uh, Bible study is for February 28th, that, Saturday, that Sunday. We're doing it a few days early, but we welcome you to the adult Bible class. We continue with the, um, in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. We're going to start at, verse, at chapter 17 today, and we make our beginning in the name of our God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Father, thank you for this opportunity to focus on your word to see how you worked in the early church and how you would work through us and with us these days so that that gospel may be spread, and that people hearing it, their hearts may be changed, their minds changed and brought to you. We ask that you begin with us, continue to work on our hearts and our minds so that in greater and greater appreciation of all you've done for us, we give ourselves completely to you and your service, 24-7. To that end, we ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit in full measure, and we ask it confidently because we come in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Paul and, and Silas in Thessalonica, uh, you may remember that Paul and Barnabas had uh, split, and now there are two missionary teams. Uh, it will be Paul and Silas. Later, very soon it will be Timothy with them and also Luke. Uh, and that combination of the four um, it will always be Paul and the others will be with him for a while or stay behind uh, in the churches that they have formed. I want to remind us again, as Paul goes from place to place, as the apostle and his helpers move from place to place, He's always moving, honestly, from victory unto victory. He is starting churches. Congregations are, are being begun in each of those places. Even when it seems as if he's a, just a step and a half ahead of the sheriff trying to get across county lines. He never, has never failed. The gospel won't fail. Uh, it may not do those things that we wish it were or bring about the results that we would like to see, but they will always accomplish what God wants. Isaiah tells us that plainly. Our God says, my word will not return to me void. And Paul says, the gospel is the power of salvation, unto salvation for all who believe. So there's going to be places and times when Paul takes his time leaving town, and sometimes when he moves pretty quickly. Nevertheless, it's from victory to victory according to God's plan. Uh, wherever he goes, uh, I don't know of any place, maybe when we talk here in Athens, well, no, even in Athens, uh, there was a church formed. And a church is going to be begun by any two or three Christians that are gathered together to worship, to praise, and to study. Now, having said that, we begin at chapter 17. Earlier, it was us, and now us is not there anymore, which means Luke is no longer with them, at least for the immediate, these immediate stories. And when they passed through Amphilius and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, that's a familiar church, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And as usual, Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead, and then adding the second point. First is the doctrine and the truth. It was necessary. The Old Testament has been pointing to this, that the Christ, the Messiah, the promised one, um, is not going to march on the way they thought, from victory unto victory. Uh, but he is going to accomplish his victory through the cross. As St. John indicates, that is the greatest glory of God, the cross and the mercy and the grace offered in that cross. So first he argues, let's, let's get the right picture of what the Christ and the Messiah is going to be. He has to suffer which would have been a scandal to the Jewish people for the most part. Uh, that's what Paul will write later. It's the stumbling block 
the, the Christ suffering. But if you go to the scriptures and look at them from the Old Testament, they're pointing to this all the time. On our Wednesday Lenten services, uh, we're focusing on the type of Christ uh, shown in the Old Testament through the lamb or the ram. Uh, they appear all the time, and there are types pointing to Christ. And every time those, that lamb appears, or a ram, they're going to be sacrificed. Um, that's the picture. So that later when John would declare of Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He didn't have to say all those other things. He didn't have to say the lamb who was sacrificed, though that will be spoken of quite a bit in the Bible. But the Old Testament is absolutely filled with Christ and Christ who must suffer, uh, necessary for our salvation according to the plan and mercy of God. After he establishes that, then he wants to make the second point. Okay, that's all good. Okay, that's all theoretical in a sense. Okay, you must suffer. Got it. Well, then he hammers it home. Who is this Christ? So that when you look at Jesus of Nazareth, nailed to a cross, you say, there's the suffering. And that's what he, he says. This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. How do we know that? Well, he was put to death. And it was also necessary for him to be raised from the dead. You don't want to leave that out of the story. Verse 4, and some of them were persuaded, and they joined Paul and Silas. There is a separation here. Uh, you're, you're moving away from the synagogue, and you're moving to become a church uh, the gathered ones, the holy ones of God. Doesn't mean you couldn't go back to the synagogue. But your new alliance was no longer, your new alliance was with the church, the true Israel, and not with the old Israel of the synagogue. Um, and certainly you wouldn't have been welcome at the synagogue very, in almost every situation. They joined, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, uh, those are believing Greeks, they, whether they were proselytes of the gate and made that extra step, or they were Greek people who believed in the Lord God Almighty, the one true God, um, who's always identified as the creator of the world and the earth. They worshipped him rather than all these other gods. And a great many, and not a few of the leading women, remember they, they're mentioned because there is no difference anymore between women and men in the church just as there is no difference between uh, true Jews and nominal Jews the proselytes of the gate that could have been kept separately there in status there is no difference from the youngest to the oldest baptized and believing in Christ we are in the same church our status is the same you've heard me say Times. Our responsibilities and the authority is different. There are leaders and there are followers uh, in the church. Chosen by God, equipped by God, uh, given the responsibility and the ability to respond. But that's not going to happen real quickly. The Jews, in verse 5, were jealous and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring him out to the crowd. Obvious, I mean, it's not obvious, but I, we assume that Jason was one of those devout um, Greeks, uh, and Paul and Silas may have made their headquarters there. So when they didn't find Paul in the synagogue, they went to where they expected to find him. Seeking to bring them out, Paul and Silas, out to the crowd. And when they couldn't find him, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers, the other Christians, before the city authorities, shouting, These men have turned the world upside down, who have, turned, have come here too. And Jason received them, and they are acting against the decrees of 
Caesar is saying that there is another king, Jesus. All kinds of stuff in there. Um, they bring him to the authorities. These are the Jews, and they bring him to the authorities the same way the Sanhedrin had brought Jesus before Pilate. And with the same accusation, he is a king. They're declaring another king. Now, whether they know it or not, they are professing the resurrection of Jesus because it is known, well known, that Jesus has died. Well, if he's a king, he can't be a king when he's dead. Long live the king. They're, in a sense, professing that Jesus is still alive. God will have his confession. Uh, he will have his glory and his praise even in the mouths of pagans and his enemies. But they took him to the city authorities, okay? And they, the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as a security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Okay, that's what it's going to be. And I just heard in our country, in some places, they're going to get rid of the cash bond. Well, that's kind of interesting. This is what they were doing way back then. Well, once they're, they didn't get Paul. They didn't get Silas. But here's a case where Paul and Silas move on in a hurry. Um, but it's a wonderful phrase. They've turned the world upside down and they're coming back here. It's a, I think that's a perfect description of Christianity of the world, over against the world. It's what Jesus had said. The first must be last, and if you want to be a master, you first have to be a servant. You always have to be a servant. That's the world turned upside down. My name was Bachelman, sat towards the front. We were usually called on first, uh, both for assignments and sometimes for privileges, but that could be whipped around just like that, and the Zs and Ws went first. That's what it means. What the world values is not valued in the church. And what we value is not valued in the church. The world is this way. Christianity is the world turned upside down. I would argue that it truly is the other way, that Christianity is the world right side up. And the world, as we think about it, is turned upside down. They have it backwards. In fact, especially when you read John, Luke, the, you read the Gospels and t uh, hear what Jesus has to say. They live in darkness. You could say, these people who have brought light to the world, that'll turn the world upside down. Uh, people do evil things in darkness. And in darkness, you can plead ignorance. But when the lights come on and you see the way things really are, well, that takes care of that anymore unless you close your eyes. The world is living in lies from beginning to end. The church, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is the truth. It is the way to life, the, what real life is. Sometimes we use that in other ways. The church is like this, but that's not the real world. No, the church is the real world. And the gospel, belonging to Christ Jesus, living for him. In this world, he created and redeemed. That's the real world. Out there is falsehood and darkness. Um, for one thing, it maybe can help us from being so defensive, right, about our faith. Uh, we know the truth. And the reason we know the truth is because it's been revealed to us. We don't take any credit for this as if we're smarter or wiser. God has given it to us. He's opened our eyes by conversion, bringing us to faith, to trust him, to see who he's like, and to be led and brought into this personal relationship with Jesus and thus to the Father through the working of the Holy Spirit. That's the real world. But people don't want to hear that very often. Turn out the lights. And, you know, what's that phrase? Don't confuse me with the facts. My mind is already made up. Okay? 
Paul and Silas in Berea. Now, they're, they're still traveling. And the brothers, so that's the church that's there in Thessalonica. Paul will later write two letters uh, to this church because for, I think for one reason, they had a lot of questions. And one of the reasons they had a lot of questions is they, Paul and Silas weren't able to stay there very long. Uh, I mean, you're not going to teach the, the Christian faith in three weeks. Uh, Luther said, a seven-year-old can understand the full gospel message, salvation in Christ Jesus, and yet scholars plumbing the depths of the scriptures will never get it all. Uh, I attest to that myself. I've been studying them for a few years now. And I find always new things, or things that I had known and forgotten. Okay. Nonetheless, I think that's the reason there's going to be letters sent back. And if you go to those letters, you'll see the confusion uh, that they had in Thessalonica. You write one, you get a response back, and uh, you, he answered back. Uh, did the same thing for Corinth, uh, in which there was great trouble uh, and needed at least two letters probably a few more well then they go to Berea and arrived there they went into the Jewish synagogue now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica by which he means they're reading the scriptures and they're open uh, for it and they received the word with all eagerness examining the scripture daily to see if these things were so Look at the scriptures, he says to the Jewish people, and see if those verses in the Old Testament, speaking of the Christ, first you've got to identify the ones that are speaking of the Christ. Are they true? Do they fit? Remember, in the 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus spent that time with the disciples, showing them where he was and where they could find him in the Old Testament, all over the Old Testament, not just in those Isaiah and, and Micah and a few prophecies that are easy to, to pick out, but in the wolf and warp of the whole part of Scripture, of the Old Testament. Okay? Many of them, therefore, believed, it, because that's the Scripture's job, now, this was the Old Testament, and it's the Scripture's job, the power of God, to change people's hearts. So by getting into the Scriptures, they were brought to believe. I mean, and that's true for our approach, too. Sometimes, if we're talking to people uh, who aren't churched or don't believe, uh, we'll use, speak some Scripture to them. And they'll say things like, well, I don't believe in the Bible. As if that's going to put you off. Well, the fact is, we know already you don't believe in the Bible. Because if you did, I wouldn't be having this conversation with you. So what I want to do is bring the word, the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation in people's hearts. They don't have to believe in the word. Uh, our job is is not to defend the word, but to use it. Say the word to them. Tell them the story. Tell them again. Tell them what it means. And find all the appropriate ways to do that. And those who are to believe will believe by the power of the word, always the power of the word. Again, there were Jews, not a few Greek women of high standing, as well as men. The order gets turned around. But that shows the equality in the church. It's no longer just men. It's no longer just Jews. It's Jew, Gentile, slave and free, men and women, all brought into the church. Luke wants to make sure that we understand that, that this is the new wine of the gospel of Christ Jesus more plainly and is more plainly given in the New Testament as the God's revelation, that new wine is going to go into new wineskins. There's a new structure in the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Well, but when the Jews from Thessalonica <laughs> learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul and Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. And I think we mentioned this before. They came 40 miles. That's a long way. It's like atheists arguing against God. If you don't believe it exists, why are you bothering with this? They came all that way, agitating and stirring up the crowds, which is the very thing they accused the Christians of, Paul and Silas doing, and they weren't doing it. They're doing it. Uh, there's no explaining unbelief. Uh, not any more than there really is explaining belief why I believe and somebody doesn't. This is the mystery of conversion and the power of God. But there is no one so blind as those who will not see. When you don't want to see it, when you don't want to look, nothing seems to be able to overcome that. Um, even the word of God. Remember the word, the gospel is, is a magnet. It attracts some, it repels others. And that's why our job is not to analyze the word or its effects, but to use it in the most effective, winsome, loving way that we can in order that the word, if, if they're going to be offended, let them be offended by the word and not our approach. Not by us, but by the word. If they're going to disbelieve let it be because they will not believe in Christ Jesus, not because we were offensive in our manner. Winsome, loving. We're not in arguments with these people. We don't want to win an argument and lose the person. We want the word to work on them. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remain there. We don't know why. We know that a church has begun, but they weren't there very long. And so uh, Paul seems to be the lightning rod. He's the one taking the abuse. Now they beat up Jason because they couldn't find him. But it seems that uh, Timothy, let's see, who's staying behind? Silas and Timothy uh, could avoid that, stay lower key, and begin to build the church. Because there's a lot of stuff in the gospel. A lot of stuff that follows our faith in Christ. It, people say things like, well, all you got to do is believe the gospel. That's the only thing necessary. Well, necessary for what? If that was the only thing necessary, the New Testament could be a very slim volume. There's a lot of stuff that we are called to to do, to grow in the change of our attitude, the changing of our mind, the way we love and treat people. The scripture helps us with that. Um, why it makes us wise unto salvation and is profitable for teaching and learning and correction and all the rest of it. Well, then the brothers sent Paul off. They remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens and after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. They took him off a ways so that he could sail, get away. They wanted to ensure that he was safe. My guess is also they wanted to keep hearing what Paul had to tell them before he left. We don't hear about Berea again. There's no letter to them, uh, but the letters of Paul... Uh, very soon in the church became universal. Even though they were addressed to the Thessalonians, they sh were spread over the, the whole church. Uh, but Paul asked them to go back. Uh, don't follow me. Go back and send Timothy and Silas to me. And then they departed. It, it's a little like... Uh, that you don't stay too long. You've got other places to go. The Ethiopian, Ethiopian eunuch early on was brought to faith in Christ and instead of going back to Jerusalem, he was sent to Ethiopia. You've got this word, now go and share it. Well, Paul in Athens, it will get at least the introduction. We may not get to the message, which is significant. 
Now, while he's waiting, we're told in verse 16, waiting for Timothy and Silas to come, at Athens, his spirit was provoked. Uh, He was agitated within him as he saw a city so full of idols. When you know the truth, this is irritating, okay? So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace. First to the Jews, even though he said, I'm not going to do that. Always first to the Jews. The Christ had to suffer. Jesus is that Christ. He died and was raised for the forgiveness of sins and the creation of a a new creation, uh, both in us personally and corporately in the, in the church. But he went to the marketplace where people spent their time talking. We're going to be told later that they spent all their time talking. Uh, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there, uh, he just waited around. He didn't go home. Uh, I'll, I'll go and talk to somebody else. I want them to know this message. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. They seem to be, those are the two philosophies. They are the Republicans and the Democrats, um, not politically, but philosophically. Uh, Greek philosophy uh, was designed to make a a person whole uh, and to help them get through life. The Epicureans said the best way to get through life is eat, drink, and be merry. Uh, and because tomorrow you're going to die, have expectations and live up to them, Uh, desires and goals. The Stoics said there was the same purpose. They wanted to be happy and content. They said, limit your, uh, don't have high goals, keep them low, Uh, and then they'll be easy to meet, and that will make you content and full and happy. Uh, Stoics are a little bit like the country western song, uh, I'm living up to her low expectations. That's what they tried to do. But they were both trying, and all the philosophies were an attempt to figure out where we came from, who we are, where we're going in, in, in a slightly different way. But that's the basis of almost all religions and most philosophies trying to answer those questions. Well, Paul had the answers. We have the answers. Where we came from, who we are, and where we're going. It's all there in the Bible for us. But he, and these guys were pros, okay? And Paul could handle himself. Paul was well educated. um, Educated both in Jewish law and in Greek philosophy. His father was a Roman citizen. Uh, Doesn't mean he wasn't Jewish, but okay. And conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Now, the word babbler, we don't have a uh, uh, a good way to translate this word. Um, This means a bit taker. Uh, You've known people who You've heard the the phrase, a a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Well, that's what they're talking about here. Uh, This is a word for people who weren't as well educated as they were. And they just went around and grabbed a little bit from here and a little bit from there, a little bit from there. It's what we today, uh, we call designer religion. Uh, I'll take a little bit here and a little bit of that, and I like what the Buddhists say there. And Oh, Jesus was a good teacher, and he loved people, and and he loved little children. That's what this means. They're putting him down. They're saying this little bit taker, uh, he doesn't have it all put together, certainly not the way we do. And babblers is good enough way. You know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's only uh, regurgitating a little bit of what he knows. I find myself doing that at times, too. Others said he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Uh, which they had never heard of. Um, Greek philosophy, and we talked about this, Greek philosophy has to do with 
making this full circle. Uh, you, you come from this force, this power, and your, your soul is a, is a little spark that came off of this force. And it lives inside of you, and your job is to get through life so that can go back. It's not like reincarnation, where you keep doing it till you get it right. This is to get back home. And w- while you're waiting, you want to do you want to be as happy and content as you can be, noble even. So they, then they bring him to the place of philosophy, the big school, the Areopagus. Um, verse 20, 20. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We want to know, therefore, what these things mean. They're a little bit like the Bereans, huh? We want to know more about it. And then here's a parenthetical statement. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Welcome to our world. Right? Something new. The old isn't any good. We've got to have something new. As if that's better. New does not necessarily make better. It makes different. But there's different people here. There's two classifications. There's the Athenians who are highly respected. And Paul's going to address his speech to them. And then these other people came in to learn from the Athenians. This is the place to go. And through this all, in in this whole big mix, Paul has some time on his hands. And he goes, and he's not going to miss this opportunity to tell them the truth and to tell them where they came from, who they are, and where they can go all through Jesus Christ. He's going to answer their issues and questions, which is our job too in a world that is lost and looking. So we'll continue then with the great speech that he makes in the Areopagus uh, next week. So receive the benediction of the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you now and forever. Amen. Have a wonderful week. Stay safe and God bless you.